Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandal Mongers podcast. Good morning. Good morning. Now, any more feedback from our multitude of fans? Well, actually, do you know what? Having upset you last week by talking about your non-existent nose hair and uh, stained corduroy trousers. Gosh, how, how shameful. There is a nicer review. Now, where did I put it? I thought I'd say this for you. Oh, yes. Here we are. From Geraldine McGowan, 2385. What a great podcast. I've enjoyed them all. But I think we do need a special on where does Andrew Loney get his energy from? (laughs) Oh, I see. Oh, right. Alcohol. Author, a literary agent, a podcaster, and a father. And a husband, too. (laughs) Phew. That's very impressive. Well, you have a fan. (laughs) There you are. It's, oh, that's great. Is there no beginning to his talents? Is there no beginning to his talents, indeed. Um, well, we finally came to it. I mean, this is the biggest scandal, isn't it? Uh, political scandal in Britain for a long time. Uh, well, interesting. Yes. I mean, it's certainly been a, a psychodrama, uh, and I didn't suspect it's ended yet. Um, uh, it's an extraordinary figure in, in British politics who's sort of dominated it for a long time, and who's had lots of ups and downs. I think he likes to compare himself to Churchill, but I think uh, not. They're not uh, quite right. I think that that analogy. No, did you vote for Johnson? Very personal question. No, I'm, I've never been a great fan of Johnson. I did. I voted for him as Mayor of London, and he was one of the first Tories in a long time to to be Mayor of London. Um, and yes, and actually Muslims. did a good job there. I mean, in some ways, this is a sort of sad story of a, a boy with great ambitions who had some early successes and kind of sort of, through his own, I think, faults of character, destroyed himself. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, but for a long time, he was sort of given a pass, wasn't he? Because most people knew that he played fast and loose with the rules and that he was a bit of a chancer. But he also had this great energy and talent for kind of boosting people's morale and a good command of the English language. And, you know, he was a kind of national figure of affectionate fun uh, for a while. And he was a vote winner. Um, and, you know, I think still, uh, you know, in the constituencies is someone who people feel they can vote for in spite of everything. I mean, it says something about this was the changing values in Britain, that someone like that can get to the top um, uh, in spite of all the children and the affairs and the lying and everything else. Indeed. Um, I mean, quite a lot of our audience is not British. Um, so, yeah, Boris Johnson, successful politician, maverick, uh, mayor of London, the face and voice of the Brexit campaign, Leave campaign. Um, very successful uh, in that role and then won an election um, after a bit of bloodletting in the Tory party. But there was lots and lots of scandals, not just the one that brought him down. I mean, there was his whole time in number 10, there was... It was the Owen Patterson affair where he tried to help somebody who'd been accused of kind of fiddling the rules on lobbying. And then he asked people to kind of vote for him and then change his mind. There was the, the, the famous golden wallpaper and suggestions he was trying to get people to fund it. Um, well, I think he has. I mean, he's had lots of people fund his. I mean, he earns a lot of money, but he's, he's, he goes through it. And and he's a great man for freebies. And, of course, he tried to get the, the Queen to... Um, uh, um, d- 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 interfere in, in domestic politics. You know, we've got a whole series of things where people, he's he's tried to bend the rules. And of course, his resignation honours list, uh, which had some pretty controversial names yeah, on it. Yeah, He's yeah. someone who who kind of feels the rules don't apply to him. Um, I think that's what, got him, that's what got him in the end, wasn't it? The, yeah. You know, the suggestion that inside Downing Street there were all these rule-breaking parties going on, whether he went to them all or not. And he didn't go to most of them, actually. But he set the tone, his own attitude, you can imagine, around him. And then, of course, people were resigning and briefing. And it was obviously a complete shambles that whole operation in Downing Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I think our, our interview, E, has a very good insight into all this as political editor of Unheard, uh, and I think has written some of the most perceptive sort of articles on, on Boris, so we're very lucky to have him. Yeah, Tom, who we're going to speak to in a minute, I think he's probably the best political writer in Britain, actually, he, he, and he really did get close to Johnson, and wrote some really interesting things about him. Yes, no, I agree. I think mean, a really interesting... Uh, an interesting guest to have. 
uh, as we come to the end of our ne- our sort of latest series. Is it is this the last one in a little run? Or we've got one more? one more, one more, and I think we've been right. discussing what we'll do there. Perhaps another royal subject. Yeah, I think maybe we need to go back to the royals. Give the people what they want. Yes, um, exactly. It's important too. It is important too. Maybe not as important as as as, as Boris Johnson, but. Uh, Yes, we'll do that. I'm, oh, yep, I should have said we're now up to nine hundred. Let me just check nine hundred and thirty-nine. Right, subscribers gosh. on YouTube. You know, we got about this. But we're getting closer and closer to our sixty-one. Website. Sixty-one is all we need. That's all we need. Um, well, hopefully, people will enjoy Tom and rush to press that subscription button. Yep, I hope so oh. on both counts. Shall we do it? Let's go for it. All right. Sweetie, a minute. Hello, Tom. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I want to start by reading some, reading you some of your own words, which I thought <laughs> might be a good a good beginning for our conversation. Here it is. Let's face it, Boris Johnson blew it. And for what? Not for drawing a trade border down the middle of a country or for handling of a pandemic. Not for some misguided foreign intervention or other government failure, policy difference, or even act of sleaze. He was dragged from power by a rebellion of his own party because they'd just become so exasperated by his dishonesty and his chaotic inability to do the job. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but ourselves. And deep down, Johnson knows this. Wow. (laughs) Seems, still seems roughly accurate, right? (laughs) It still seems remarkable, really, that such a man, for all his many great qualities, and we'll we'll get to those, I'm sure, could actually ever become prime minister, don't you think? I suppose it's the um, the interesting character traits that you need as a campaigner versus a, an administrator, um, and that's they're two different skill sets, I think. And I, I suppose you're seeing something of that with Keir Starmer now, in slightly kind of dull campaigner, but perhaps he will be um, a very good administrator. Who, you know, who knows? But with Johnson, yeah, it, this is a guy that a lot of people who had worked with him obviously believed he was sort of uniquely unsuited to the job of prime minister. You know, there were others who had worked with him who thought actually that the only job he could do would be prime minister, you know, that he wasn't suited to all of the other jobs in, uh, in the cabinet, you know, foreign secretary, he wasn't a very skilled foreign secretary. and wasn't seen as um, having been very effective. Um, he needed to be like the figurehead, the leader. Uh, so some people thought he would it would suit him um, and that, you know, he, what he really needed was a sort of prime minister of his own underneath him, a kind of mm. Michael Gove or a... Well, that was what he had as, as mayor of London. I mean, he seemed to be good at delegating and people were running the show and he was just the front man. Exactly. He had Eddie Lister, didn't he, in London famously, who had, was it Wandsworth Council he'd run? So, he, you know, he this, this guy knew London and he knew how to um how to administer and johnson was able to be the salesman on top the guy who went and campaigned for london all around the world and for himself obviously you know with his eye on on number 10 i i do think that actually i think what he needed was somebody to run the show and he never quite got that eddie lister was brought back in to number 10 he he needed a willy or perhaps he didn't (laughs) <laughs> yes, he had he had uh, an effective one of his own, I think, uh, part of the problem. Um, okay, for our non-British listeners, this is a very funny, slightly dirty joke. Mrs. Thatcher <laughs> always said I needed a Willie, and of course she meant Willie Whitelaw, who was famously her chief of staff. Johnson, of course, well, the word can mean many things with him. <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, he's uh, one for the ladies. Um, but he, yeah, he. I, I do think that is a, a key, and I think he would acknowledge that, actually, that, he there was just such instability there wasn't there he had eddie lister who came back but he was on his way into retirement he didn't want to be there full time he had dominic cummings for the first six months where and that was probably johnson's most effective time as prime minister where he took a really desperate situation and managed to um, turn it to his advantage winning an election after six months uh, you know, an extraordinary election victory, 80 seat majority, biggest since uh, I think the 1987 election for the Conservative Party. You know, so this was a remarkable and taking the country out of the European Union, the thing that Theresa May had not been able to do. And but during that time, he had Dominic Cummings uh, with him driving 
this sort of ship of state uh, at the wall, really, and daring, um, you know, and, and saying, you know, I'm a kamikaze. I will, I will smash this thing to bits unless unless we get what we want. And they got what they wanted. And then the pandemic hit. You know, this is, I mean, this is a remarkable period in British politics from the Brexit crisis immediately into the pandemic. You know, the pandemic hit. I think while Johnson was on holiday in the Caribbean, sort of. Uh, resting after his election victory uh, in the December, and then bang, and then it all falls apart because it's it, you know can you think of a crisis more that he is less suited to than managing a pandemic? You know it's hard to think of one. Well, that's tr- true, and you know famously, obviously the, the the Downing Street parties people will always remember as the, the the trigger that got rid of him. But I think people knew, didn't they, that he and and and, and maybe people didn't care. That, that he was a rule breaker, that he that he didn't seem to bother with, and you know, normal societal responsibilities, and broken marriages, and betrayed women, and just a chaotic, slightly dishonest man. But perhaps we decided in 2019 that was the man we needed for that crisis, but not, as you say, the next one, which needed maybe focus, responsibility, managerial skill, uh, and, and and honesty, which he just didn't seem to have. Yes, yeah. You you look back, don't you, and you think Theresa May um, was uniquely unsuited to the the crisis that she was given uh, mm. Brexit. She was too dogmatic. She she couldn't bring. She couldn't build a team. She couldn't sell her deal. She couldn't sell her deal in Europe. She couldn't sell it at home. She just she just couldn't. She didn't have the skill set necessary for the crisis that she she inherited. She would have been quite good in the um, in the COVID pandemic if that had been the crisis that she had faced. You know, she was honest, serious, earnest. You know, on top of the detail, all of those things. I mean, what she wasn't was was decisive, which perhaps you needed to be during that crisis. And Johnson was the reverse. You know, he had the skill set for the particular crisis at the beginning. You know, where. Um, you know the country needed the country the country had got into this pe- period of stasis you know it, it was completely stuck um between the two camps in parliament uh and perhaps you needed a kind of shyster to uh to smash it open um and and, and i think there are lots of mps that do reflect on this period and think you know if parliament had been more effective it had been if, if it had been able to do its job perhaps Perhaps Johnson would never have become prime minister. And then, as you say, he becomes, um, you know, we move into this different um, crisis and, and it's the honesty that was the problem. But but again, we, we should look at the history because I was going in and out of Downing Street uh, to profile Johnson uh, in early 2021. Um, and by this time, his popularity is very high. You know, he survived COVID himself. You know, he'd got very sick. He'd gone into hospital. There was a level of public sympathy for him and what he's, you know, and his family. Uh, and there was that sense of, you know, when you're when you're in crisis that you all come together. And I think that carried him through. And then there was that period where people felt that Britain had done OK because of the vaccine rollout and it had been slightly quicker than in Europe at the time. Um, and so there was this general sense of Johnson hasn't been so bad or the things, the mistakes that he has made, they're understandable because we're in a crisis. People were giving him the benefit of the doubt. Mm. That, that The height of that period was the uh, um, by-election in Hartlepool where the Conservative Party won the by won the election, and this was a. Rock you, you were travel. You were travelling with him, weren't you? At this point, I think. Yes, I remember it. I remember it clearly because you'd go to Hartlepool, and I'm from the northeast of England. You know, this is former Labour territory, and Johnson was a was an enormous asset for the party. There was a big balloon a blimp of Johnson uh, when you got to Hartlepool. People were thanking him in the streets for what he'd done during COVID. You think think of that now. You know that really isn't that that long that 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 long, far away that was that's two years ago uh that this was happening and then obviously it starts to fall apart um and and i think we can you know there are lots of ways of thinking about that i mean first of all you, he has to think, take the blame himself you know his the, the revelations of what was actually happening inside start to um under undermine all of that public um sympathy that he had that oh we're all in this together it's been tough for everybody but we've all suffered you know we've got through it together any mistakes we you know all prime ministers would have made mistakes that was the general feeling 
and then it and then it dissip, it dissipates very quickly once it looks like he's taking the mickey and not abiding by the rules himself partying while you know people couldn't what, see their dying relatives was there a moment when he could have saved himself i mean was this inevitable because he didn't really have people supporting him or or could he have actually changed things once partygate started i think he undoubtedly could have handled it better if he had have um you know if he'd have come out honestly early on and said look i didn't know the extent of what was going on but it seems absolutely it seems clear uh from that we've actually broken uh some rules we're you know we're desperately sorry we um you know this was a height of a crisis um etc you know come clean Mm. dealt with it in one in, in one go rather than this kind of drip 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 in you know uh s- scandal that was it just it just built and built and built uh and then it became a question of honesty you know and so you and, couldn't you couldn't trust him and was this sort of overconfidence i'm just thinking going back to cameron and and the brexit refer and the referendum that the people had had sort of um he he just thought he was unassailable so he he didn't need in some ways to to make any concessions or to build a team around him yeah absolutely i i think i mean there's certainly a, certainly a question of hubris and the fact that you know he he'd become prime minister doing the same thing his entire life you know so he'd made he'd been sacked from the times for lying when he was younger and then he ended up at the telegraph and become pretty much the most famous journalist in britain and had earning more than any virtually any other journalist he'd um lied to the uh proprietors of the spectator that he wouldn't become an mp at the same time as being the editor of the spectator magazine and he'd done it anyway and he hadn't faced the consequences he'd been sacked from the conservative front bench for lying about an affair and then ended up as uh mayor of london um and so i think with johnson he is absolutely loath more than anything to bow to somebody else's rules you know that he or or to be in somebody else's pocket to owe somebody something for his rise or his position and so he would never uh he would never have done that he would never have sort of you know feel that he had to sort of bow and scrape that's the last thing he ever wants to do um he's a he you know he's a a rule breaker by do you think he's finished i mean i mean all, he after all almost came back i mean he got the 100 mm-hmm. votes um when he could have stood against rishi sunak and stood stood back and i mean clearly he's out of parliament now but i mean do you think that he might find a seat and that perhaps and come back see I, see i used to think um along those lines that exactly as you say when when this trust imploded what is remarkable is how close he came to returning you know and we, remember we're talking six weeks after he left office you know imagine that you know six weeks within a six week period a premiership blows up and the man who had been kicked out for losing the faith of his own party would just suddenly return and, and, and also all his ministers are resigning i mean they had no support really within the parliamentary party or very exactly. little exactly yeah um you know that that's what cost it um there was this sort of mass stampede away from him and and yet six weeks later it looked as though he might not get the numbers and indeed um graham brady the chairman of the 1922 committee had said that um johnson had got the numbers uh to make it onto the ballot so there w- it would have been johnson and rishi sunak who would have then been presented to the conservative party membership who would have then voted on that over the summer and you know johnson is still popular among the members so you add those two things together and you say well actually johnson wasn't so far away from returning as prime minister now so that gives you a, 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 a an inkling of the level of support he has now i think there are a t- couple of caveats on that one is that the list that he apparently presented to graham brady was you know a, a not necessarily to be trusted there were people on that list who who apparently were supporting boris johnson who said that they weren't supporting boris johnson so let's see how much sort of showmanship there is but i think it's much much harder for him now he's outside of parliament he um if he is going to stand in any seat he needs the leader of the party to sign off on that um to to accept him 
you know, uh, standing in a certain seat. That seems, uh, I, if if I was a Conservative Party leader, at any point, I would be reluctant for, to, to have Boris Johnson back in Parliament sniffing around. So that's a hurdle. Um, he's also just deeply unpopular in the country. And so that's the second big hurdle. So I I, I don't know. I, I I don't think it's impossible because the Labour Party is likely to win the next election, and then and therefore there's going to be some bloodletting in the Conservative Party. But it seems very difficult for me now for for him now. I think. And why do you think he's suddenly so unpopular? You say that two years ago, you know, he was being thanked for COVID. So what changed public perception? Well, I think the sense that. Um, he had he had lied to them and that he had um you know that he had he was sort of taking the mick out of the country so i think for a long time this is how i see it anyway for a long time johnson had uh had taken the mick out of the establishment he'd mm-hmm. taken uh he'd taken the mickey out of those who deserved the mickey to be taken out of them he sort of nodded and winked at you uh the public and said look these guys who take themselves so seriously you shouldn't take themselves so ser- you shouldn't take them as seriously he was a lovable as- rogue a false a false staffian figure and a certain yeah. part of the british character i think responds warmly to that until covid exactly and i think also it suited the times you know this is a time post um 1990 end of the cold war end of history all of that where you had these um this dominance from the center uh and a, and a sense that um politics was not really a, a a debate about values or a debate about uh you know economic systems uh but about manager uh, you know who can manage it best you know everybody agrees on on virtually everything you know the the bank of england manages interest rates and inflation the economy uh it, it just ticks along like this you know nobody really wants to change it very much you know one one point here or there on on tax rates but that's essentially agreed and you just take that money and you invest it into public services and maybe the conservatives will invest a little bit less or a little bit more but you know but broadly the politics had been solved you know in this uh in this period and johnson's there sort of mocking that and um laughing at these figures and and undermining these people like uh, Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell and all of these kind of uh people and and also doing something um which was unique which was laughing at himself um and so everybody else is is very serious uh, austere kind of people and he's laughing at himself so obviously the public like that i think once you become prime minister it's obviously very different isn't it because you're um it, it it's a difficult thing to laugh at yourself as prime minister because you're the authority you're having to make rules for everybody else, that everybody else has to follow uh and that's difficult and particularly in an emergency a public health emergency you know that is you, you just can't you can't do that you can't at one hand lock people up in their houses and then kind of wink at them and say this is all a bit of a nonsense isn't it you know obviously i don't believe in this i don't i know i don't wear my mask i don't i know i don't i don't actually think that this is a good idea um that's that's a very different sell than um than you know winking and mocking authority from the outside i think that's a really and do you think point. resignation on his list is also in a sense part of this in a sense taking the mickey um, because clearly he was putting into the House of Lords someone who was he was advised by intelligence services not to 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 put there. Um there are a number I mean he was putting in a young woman who worked in his office into the House of Lords in her twenties. I mean, do you think this has stimulated the demand for con- some sort of constitutional change? Because we have now the the Keir Starmer talking about putting in a hundred peers to get a majority in the House of Lords. Um, and do you think, I mean, the public are beginning to feel that politicians are in it just for themselves rather than to run the country? Well, this is this gets back to an interesting sort of conundrum about Boris Johnson, I guess, in that he he benefited from the sense that all politicians are the same and that they, you know, that they're all corrupt and that they all put, you know, their cronies into number 10. Uh, and so he feels kind of, um protect it you know he just he said well well, of course i'm going to do this it's the shamelessness of johnson that is so striking it's that's like you know 
other people will do it, but they won't put a 20, what, how old was she again? I can't remember, 28, yeah. 29. I won't put a 29 year old, but I'll put a 40 year old, you know, or somebody, you know, I'll put, you know, what did Harold Macmillan, I think, was it, was it Harold Wilson put his barber, you know, in, he gave him an honor, you know, and Harold Macmillan, um, also was advised by the civil service not to uh, give various people honors and, and ignored them and said, no, I'm going to do it. So this has been going on for, you know, what's that 70 years, 60 years. Uh, but it's the shamelessness, I think, that is so striking. You just kind of go, my God, you know, that none of these people seem to uh, seem to justify it. It's not just a few. It's kind of, you know, Lord Lebedev of Siberia. You know, that is a striking thing to, to read. Um, and that is the, um, I think that is Johnson's problem. And it comes on top of all of the other things. You know, it just seems so strikingly contemptuous of the rules. But of course, that was always his superpower. You know, and I think this is the interesting thing with Johnson. He's not a uh, and sort of anarchic, uh, let's burn this down kind of figure. Like I'm sort of like Cummings is a bit of a sort of Maoist. You know, let's let's burn this down and start again. Johnson's not that. He's never been that. You know, he's he is a person who uh, breaks the rules within the establishment. You know, from Eton, Oxford, Spectator, Telegraph, and Parliament. He goes in, he mocks those who are in charge in these institutions as kind of stuffy old shirts who, you know, you can just ignore uh, and get things done. But he doesn't actually want to tear the system down. Uh, and that's the contradiction with Johnson. Do you think his vendetta with Cummings was the beginning of the end? I mean, we probably mm. haven't heard the full story, but it seems that Downing Street was 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 just a complete shambles of competing factions one led by his wife carrie and one led by cummings and then cummings losers and then he's now outside calling johnson all kinds of names and one hears leaking stories about the parties i mean do you think if, if he if he kept tight with his consigliere he might still have survived or or, or, or not yeah i thought that it wasn't just the beginning of, of the end sort of personally it was the beginning in the of the end of of um johnson with any kind of grip or agenda you know so again going back to this this idea of him needing his own prime minister to be prime minister johnson had alighted on a on an agenda that seemed quite powerful and potentially transformative in british politics which was to make making sense of brexit by saying okay it's a uh, it's a call for a different type of economy uh, which is uh, more geographically fair the leveling up the north so that it's um it's of a similar sort of wealth and prosperity as the south um and this brexit would be the kind of spur for this now you know we, we can we can argue about whether it actually helps or makes it harder um but you can see the logic of that and you can see both the electoral logic changing the map in Britain, um, creating a, a conservative, a sort of permanent conservative majority, or you know, semi-permanent, um, and and also you can see the logic in that for the for the UK state as a whole, which has become fragile and uh, imbalanced uh, in the South. The union is fragile, so all of these things make sense. Rebalance the economy away from the southeast to the north of England, those places which voted Brexit, um, to Scotland, to Northern Ireland, to Wales, places that are poor. And he had alighted on this as the uh, 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 uniting the country and levelling up. And this was the sort of post-Brexit mission. And it was driven in large part by Dominic Cummings, who, um, who sort of believes this and has this kind of righteous fury about the ineffectiveness of the British state um, and the sort of, in his view, the kind of charlatans that are running it, that just cre have created this system that is dysfunctional and has left much of the country poor and much of the state ineffective. And that's that's Cummings' view. And I felt with when Cummings left, um, that project to remake the British state and to remake the British economy um, really lost its driving force. And with that, what was left? What was left of Johnsonism? Where was the where was the kind of cohesion there? And and I think that shows you that to a certain extent, there was a shallowness 
of the of the project you know there wasn't a, a, there wasn't a depth of belief in the conservative party and you saw that with the election of Liz Truss who essentially jumped most of what Johnson and Cummings had uh, had stood for um and Johnson now is is sort of sounds more like a Trussite uh than he ever did in 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 government so I felt there was a loss of a sort of ideological cohesion with uh, or drive purpose when Cummings left but as you say more importantly than that is that he just lost control of this person who uh who had uh, an ability an enormous ability it turned out to undermine him um and he did so and this is unique for Johnson in a way he doesn't tend to fall out with people if you go back through his career he has these tremendous fallouts you know he cheats on his wives he um he lies to his bosses uh, and yet apart from a few figures max hastings and and a few others he doesn't tend to um cause real personal animosity in people a lot of people tend to quite like him and and sort of forgive, forgive him, him. Yeah, the name we haven't mentioned is Michael Gove, because this is all again part of the psychodrama. This is all part of the leveling up. I mean, w- was what's the state of that relationship? And would, uh, in some ways, I thought Michael Gove was the person who was in some ways driving many of the, the reforms. Yeah, I mean, you could trace it back, couldn't you, all the way to the... Um... The, the the few days after the referendum in 2016 where it was all set it was all set for johnson to go and win the conservative leadership uh supported by michael gove who would who would probably have taken up this position as his you know prime minister <laughs> in effect mm-hmm. you know the man in the man in charge his willy um and then they fell out um over that weekend and michael gove went and set up his own leadership campaign uh, and the psychodrama is fascinating. You know, Michael Gove, um, the adopted uh, boy uh, from the north of Scotland who who has spent his life among these kind of Oxbridge, Etonian type figures, pres- secretly resenting them, perhaps, somewhere in his soul, sort of. Well, you know, yes, not- he has. I mean, he's not so secretly. I think he has been quite open about the sort of um, public school mafia. Um, but, I mean, I think one of the interesting things is, I mean, Boris bottled out then. He bottled out when he maybe had those 100 uh, MPs supporting him after Truss went. So in some ways, he he wants this job uh, and he seems to keep wanting it. And yet when it comes to the crunch, he doesn't in some ways seize the the, the mace. He always thinks uh, that he, you know, his his time will come, you know, stay in the game and you will you know your a, ch- a chance will be there never you know never discount yourself always stay in the game uh and wait for your moment and i guess it worked for him you know uh and that not many people actually become prime minister look at those extraordinary figures who who didn't uh you know your heseltines of this world um or your rab butlers and all of these figures who who were who went uh again and again ken clark uh whereas johnson made it um and uh, but you're right it is interesting but maybe he's good at he's good at judging these moments um maybe if he had stood against gove uh he wouldn't have won the second time um you know if he if he had stood against gove in 2016 i think though there's clearly uh, you know it gets at this kind of slapdash um chaotic character who could have wrapped it up back then um and he didn't need for this to for this to happen during his uh during his premiership he just he really didn't uh and again he you know he'd he'd made up with with michael gove and then he fell out with him towards the end again he fell out with rishi sunak uh so he does i mean i was saying before that he he, he people tend to forgive him and that is a, a running theme of his uh of his career and his life um and yet there is also an, another running theme which those people who get close to him get burnt and get discarded um and so you see you see the the two sides of him and i think this is this gets at the the, the character of boris johnson he he is uh, a far more complicated um figure a, a loner a kind of slightly depressive uh sad character in many ways uh when he is alone um 
you know, he's 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 the guy that everyone says, the the, the politician that people say they want to go to the pub with, uh, and yet he doesn't go to the pub. You know, he doesn't. And it does, it doesn't really do parties, which is funny, given that parties have kind of brought him down. But there is one place I think you'd agree, yes. Tom. It, one place where he will always be popular, I suspect, and that's Ukraine. I mean, they're naming their children after him, and not ones that he's fathered. We assume. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him, but. You know, they love him there, and for good reason, I think. It's probably his one great achievement, in my opinion, is that he saw the danger. Forget his previous involvement with the Russians. We know that was terrible, but he did act. Most of the European Union leaders didn't. Um, and maybe that's one side of his character, that in the end, his impetuousness, courage, I don't know, what would you call it? The, the, or has he the, taken did the world some good? Or has he taken credit for other people's work, like Ben Wallace? Well, maybe Ben Wallace was important too, of course, yeah. So I would say that I, I, yeah, I think the most interesting thing is is exactly as you say. There is um, there are character traits that can have beneficial uh, results uh, in certain circumstances and have disastrous results in other circumstances. And I think his impetuousness, his his refusal to bow to authority, his uh, the the fact that he just doesn't care what the foreign office are telling him, that he thinks they're all a bit useless and soft and uh have no courage all of these things um that helped i think in uh in ukraine i think ben wallace has done has done well but i think i think it comes from the top jo uh, ben wallace was able to operate skillfully uh in an environment which he had been given the green light to start shipping arms to to ukraine and, and and get on board that that's that's how that's how i see it um but i think it's the same uh impetuousness and belief in in character that actually what's most important is not rules and um structures it's character um that cost him so dearly in the pandemic um and and in other ways you know all of these silly scandals about uh, you know, wallpaper, um, uh, you know, internal decorations in his Downing Street flat, just not abiding by the rules, getting money from somebody else. You know, that I, I think that is also him just going, oh, just ignore, you know, uh, the, the cabinet secretary, the civil, what the civil servants are doing. Just was just somebody sort it out and do it. And uh, and that gets him into trouble. But it's the same thing. I do think that he says in Ukraine, I'll just ignore those doomsayers in, uh, you know, in the Foreign Office or the MOD, just get the stuff out to out to Ukraine. Interesting. And do you think a change in his domestic circumstances has also uh, affected him? I mean, he had a long term marriage with a woman who was uh, seen to be giving him good advice. And he's now, as, as Phil says, a wife who's in such a war with his advisors and, and who wants to interfere more overtly. Yeah, I think it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting debate, isn't it? Because it's very hard to know from the outside whether the kind of Lady Macbeth uh, stereotype of Carrie is uh, fair or or not. You know, and there's people inside who who were work, working in Number Ten who who still don't know. You know, they just don't know uh, whether uh, Carrie was working against them uh or whether it was always johnson and johnson would say you know what can i do it's her upstairs you know and <laughs> and, and ultimately that's um th that uh that is something that um is bad for johnson rather than carrie principally in that you know he he comes across as either he's either weak uh in that he's being told what to do by his wife and he's the prime minister you know for Christ's sake, or he is too, um, you know, he's too weak to to admit that it's his decision and that he wants to get rid of somebody, and so he's using his wife as an excuse. And no, we, we just don't know. That's the truth. And people who are who are in there don't know. You know, there are lots of people who obviously feel that Carrie was this major destabilizing force. People like uh, Cummings and and those who are uh, loyal to Cummings. Um, and yes, it is interesting, isn't it, to go back and think that I get one of the the chaotic things around Johnson's life in this period of time has been that his relationship with his second wife, Marina, the white, the, the mother of uh, four of his children, 
uh, probably the, the most stable relationship he's had in his life, broke down before he became prime minister. And what looks at the outset, from the outside, like a bit of a tempestuous relationship with Carrie um, started. Um, and you remember that story of the police being called to the flat in oh, the, the wine on the sofa. Yeah. And, you know, this is... This shouldn't happen before a leadership, you know, before you become prime minister. Um, it just shouldn't, you know, those things are mad distractions that you can't. You, People you can't. don't know that there was a shouting match. He apparently spilled a bottle of wine. She was cross. Uh, and yeah. Somebody actually called the police because they were worried about people shouting at each other in the flat. Yeah, they were worried about her, weren't they? Um, and it became a, a national story. And yeah, that gives you an, a sense of the of the chaos and the tempestuous nature of that relationship. But who's to say? I mean, you know, we could be we could be having this conversation in twenty years' time, and he's still with Carrie, and it turns out that she's the love of his life, and uh, you know, she's the stabilizing force after he'd left Parliament. Well, uh, who knows? Who knows? We're talking. We only got a minute or so left. And thank you so much for this really insightful conversation. What do you think his long-term effect on British politics will be, if any? I mean, will will the will he kind of how will he be remembered? Oh, I think he'll be remembered, you know, badly. Uh, in that uh, he has the people who hate him hate him with such a vehemence and for legitimate reasons um, that. Uh, and he and he is, uh, you know, he's given so much ammunition to people in the way he's behaved um, that they'll look at him as a sort of uh, as a low point for standards and you know decency and all of that. Um, I do think, though, um, the, the 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 core um, his core legacy is going to be Brexit. You know, he inherited a situation that was as bad as the one that Theresa May faced. You know, no majority in parliament for any form of brexit or for remain and he turned that into a majority at the election to get britain out of the european union and then he delivered that uh, drawing a a trade border within the uk between great britain and northern ireland so his his legacy is actually one that will last for far longer than almost any other legacy of any other prime minister because it's so stark so that's, I think, ultimately what he'll be, he'll be remembered for. Well, in 20 years' time, we'll have you on again. <laughs> yes. Well, so, I hope a bit sooner than that. Who knows? <laughs> Boris may be back a lot sooner. Than... Yes. Well, Andrew, might, Andrew could be publishing his next biography. Who knows? Well, I wonder if we're ever going to get a, a bi biography that really gets to the heart of the enigmatic Boris. Well, perhaps you have to write it, Andrew. Anyway, Tom, thank you so much. <laughs> really appreciate your time. Thanks me. very much. That's really interesting. No problem. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a Podcast World production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio.